Good evening. My name is Keith Campbell. I'm here at Harding Economics Academy. Our mission is to prepare students for college in an arts and academically challenging arts integrated environment. We are pleased to be hosting tonight's community discussion panel as part of our Mercy and Justice Conference. This conference is part of a month long study into the book Just Mercy by Brian Stevenson. Had, if you don't have a copy of Just Mercy, uh, we can take care of that for you. We have a, a grant that took care of that, so uh, we'll just talk to us from, in, in the lobby. Uh, junior English students began the semester by reading and analyzing the book so that they can learn more about the social and cr criminal justice reform. Uh, our students and community members also experienced a classic film series, uh, the movie Trial from 1955, after school book clubs, after School Book Club met several times, presentations from the Oklahoma Innocence Project, and performances from HFAA's Black Student Association based on the themes of mercy and justice. We are here to join, today to join in a healthy and productive community, community discussion with local experts and leaders. Our main goal is to highlight the work of local leaders as they share their opinions and experiences. I think I can confidently say that nothing would thrill me our admin team, faculty, and staff more than flashing forward 10, 15, or 20 years and having our students in a position where they are asked to be involved and to share their experiences in advocating for the marginalized in our society as our panelists are tonight. I have often said that if the toughest problems in our society are going to be solved, they are going to be solved by students who graduate from places with like Harder Finance Academy, where we value each person and we value your creativity. Before I introduce our moderator tonight, I want to let you know that there we will have an opportunity to ask questions near the end of our presentation, and I'll pass out three by five cards, and we'll, we'll do it that way. So you can put your question on the card, and I'll grab it back, and I'll kind of sort the cards into categories, and then I'll ask our moderator to keep us on time. I want to say thank you to our school board, our foundation board, our superintendent, Mr. Schmalzenbach, our admin team, Ms. Messerly, who took on this project with her students, and Ms. Fields, who helped us also moderate the book club. Ms. Shannon McKenrick, who is our foundation uh, executive director, who wouldn't be able to do this without the uh, hard work of these people. Let's give a quick applause, round of applause and if, as I introduce our moderator for tonight, District Judge Kenneth N. Stoner.
I think I had a little bit of notoriety on that because we were kind of innovative in the way that we did that. Uh, and, and I was supported by the governor to become the district judge of Oklahoma County. And, and as a district judge, I oversee our uh, primary departure court, so our Oklahoma County uh, Drug Court. Uh, or we have a DUI court. We, also have, we just started a veterans treatment court about a year and a half ago. Uh, and I also oversee the Remarch program. So it's a program for uh, mothers who, for women who have children that are just as involved that are prison bound. And I think that's the focus of my practice is working with uh, individuals who are in the criminal justice system that have identified with a moderate to severe substance use disorder or a mental health need. Uh, they usually failed normal probation multiple times, and my programs were the last stop before prison. So uh, I'm really proud to say that our Oklahoma County Drug Court, we have an 83% graduation rate, uh, and that means uh, you know, more than four to five people that come into the program end up being successful, having their life restored, uh, their sober, and jobs, housing, uh, and productive members of our community. And, uh, 18 months before that, they were usually facing prison, usually leaving prison for five, on average, let's say seven years. Uh, and so uh, I really became familiar over the years with the work of Brian Stevenson and uh, Just Mercy. I got to meet him in person a couple of years ago, and he's a great inspiration. Uh, one of the things that, that Brian Stevenson said that uh, I couldn't agree more with is, which is if you want to solve a problem, you have to get close to it. You have to get close to the problem. And so, uh, and in our drug courts and our treatment courts, that's, you know, we're, we're front line working with individuals. Uh, it's, it can be a difficult population to work with from time to time, but it's, uh, it's very, very meaningful work. I'm really lucky to have uh, partners uh, in our community that are doing uh, real very innovative work. Uh, one other thing that's a little bit different about me, I actually have uh, some teenagers. So uh, I, my, my son is a sophomore in high school right now, and I have, um, I have two older sons that are just at college age. Uh, and um, the, uh, about uh, well, 2011, I got to meet to win a Cuban because uh, I started, have you ever, have you ever seen TED Talks and TED.com? So I started TEDx OKC in Oklahoma City and also TEDx OU at the University of Oklahoma. And I did that because I was very interested in Ideas that can change, that they can, ideas that can uh, be implemented, that can have an impact in our community, uh, and exchange of ideas. And uh, I, I, just, I love the, the innovation that comes out of those conferences. And uh, when Cuban got to speak at uh, the TEDx OPC, if you ever see his video, you can go on YouTube and look up him, and he, he knocked it out of the park on his uh, TEDx uh, talk several years ago. But right now, I'd like to start with uh, Mr. David Britt, if you would please. Uh, you picture, introduce yourself, uh, what you do, and maybe what your interest is in, in, in being here in the criminal justice department. Uh, okay, my name is David Britton. Um, so I, I got started in um, social services about 15 years ago. It's been uh, most of my professional career. Um, I've worked in uh, disaster recovery, homeless services, refugee resettlement, um, human trafficking. Um, and in every one of those situations, I work with you know, marginalized people. And um, once I, I started working in that field, um, I just fell in love with it. With all of the people that um, come through the door, it's amazing to, to see them. So, for the last uh, about two years or so, I've been in at the diversion hub. Um, I'll have an opportunity to tell you a little bit more about it later. But, uh, we help folks that are um, uh, involved in the justice system um, getting out of jail, getting back on their feet, getting housing, employment, um, mental health, substance abuse. Um, just walking alongside them to, to get them assistance that they need. Okay, Kashiki Chowdhury. Yeah. Hi everyone, uh, my name is Kashiki Chowdhury. Um, I am an attorney. I work at a nonprofit in Tulsa, Oklahoma called Still Shoe. 
share answers. Um, so my um, kind of venture into this space is um, I went to law school, did not know what I wanted to do, really, except me, I wanted to go to public interest law, and I kind of stumbled into doing public defense work, um, which is kind of um, somewhat similar, but uh, generally the same area as uh, Brian Stevenson kind of landed. And I was a public defender for about six, seven years in Colorado, moved to Tulsa five years ago, and worked at a nonprofit representing mothers who are justice involved um, in both the criminal legal system and the family legal system. Hello, everybody. My name is Wendell Keeling. I'm a lieutenant with the Oklahoma City Police Department. That's uh, my full time gig. I've uh, done everything, I think, in 25 years in law enforcement from patrol to field training to uh, teaching some out of the academy, some, some uh, classes there, uh, even, even some undercover stuff. So I've been in four or five years in undercover work and street crime unit. And currently, uh, I do a youth outreach program called FACT, Family Awareness and Community Teamwork, where I get to mentor inner city youth, uh, help them find their purpose, uh, and, and get involved in the community, and just uh, deal with their poor decision making or resistance to authority or even criminal behavior. Uh, I think uh, people might know me a lot because of my natural mentor playing thing. The TED Talk, obviously, and I, I host a popular United Voice uh, Oklahoma podcast, and we do live stream and talk conversations with you on Facebook. And so I'm really involved and interested in nonprofit and service to the community that it does happen to us. Assalamu alaikum, everyone. My name is Maureen Charmer. I am a representative for House of Security, which is where I'm sitting in right now. Um, uh, before being elected in 2020, ACLU um, uh, as a community organizer, and I specialized in justice reimagining and rebuilding. Right? I think a lot of the times we talk about reform, and I guess we'll find out a little bit more my personal thoughts about it. But um, uh, and so did that for three years. Um, before that, I worked uh, with uh, the Council on American Islamic Relations, another um, civil rights and liberties group, and before that, uh, the NAACP, another civil rights and liberties group. Um, so rising liberties are kind of my thing. So uh, that's what I do. Uh, before that, I uh, just will become a veterinarian because that was the only thing I could imagine doing in life. And now, uh, keeping me organized as a mechanic that I'm doing in life. So that's a little bit about me. Well, thank you. Uh, so let's just start with something that Oklahoma is really good at, or really bad at, I guess, I've been able to say it. Um, we have a a special designation of Oklahoma that we're really good, really bad at locking people up. As a matter of fact, uh, when you look at uh, incarceration rates, Oklahoma has the highest incarceration rate in the world per capita. Uh, the United States is number one, and Oklahoma is number one in the United States. Uh, if you also rewind the clock back to 1975, go forward. The, the, our incarceration rate uh, in the United States is five times higher today than it was in 1975. Uh, and so the United States, we're locking a lot more people up. Oklahoma is leading the way in that. You have any insight or comment on how do you think we got here? And I'll kind of leave it to anybody who wants to hop in. Yeah. I think. We, we have to think about uh, our incarceration rate relative to crime because the first thing you're going to think of when you hear five times more people uh, incarcerated, well, our crime rate must be going up at that rate too. Well, since 1978, from 1978 to 2018, uh, our crime rate actually increased 20%, but our incarceration rate increased 700%. And so it's not relative. And so I think a little bit of that is, uh, has to do with the war on drugs during that time, and then in 1994, the crime did. And most of that, a lot of that, you know, that 20% is that we are victim of our own fears. We see that, that increase in victimization, and we have a penal response to it. Uh, we want 
to hurry up and punish those wrongdoers. And, and I don't want to minimize the accusation. I don't want to minimize that at all. But in 1978, nothing happened to me and my family. We were not victims of crime. But in 1979, we were. It just went up 100% to me. So I don't, you know, I don't want to minimize that. But, but as a society, we have penalized uh, the, the, the slight increase in crime harshly. Harshly. And that, that would be the wrong drugs in the 1994 crime. You know, I, I, you know we, we have this thing called the Oklahoma Standard, right? Where we, we feel like we're, you know, we're good people, we're generous people, uh, we help our neighbor, we, we love each other. Um, so why is it that we lock up more people than Texas? Because we're definitely not worse than Texas, right? So it has to be systems. It has to be what, what Wayland was talking about. Um, and the fact that we, really emphasize when, when the politician says, um, I'm tough on crime, they seem to get elected. And, and what that's done is, is really drive up the, the jail and prison population. And, um, what we're going to talk about maybe, I think, is alternatives to incarceration that will be much better for our citizens. Um, I could just say, Kind of my thoughts on that, and part of it is also that uh, there's just the prison system has become the answer to everything. So it's become the answer to mental health. It's been the answer to rehabilitation. It's become the answer to any uh, just humanness. And so there is this, from my perspective, a one a kind of lack of empathy that's happening. Why someone ended up in this position, um, and what systems may have failed them to to have them end up in that position, um, and so the you know we're going to talk a little bit more about this about social service organization and then the concept of maybe like defunding the police and all that means, but there is a lack of funding to real change um, agents that could happen within the community, and the easy answer oftentimes is, let's just put them in jail, and then they don't have to think about it. And it's just kind of turning a blind eye to what is going to become a bigger issue when someone is released from jail, and what does that look like for society? I'm kind of curious, yeah, the word, uh, our prisons are run by the Department of Corrections. And so I'm just curious, uh, what would be your opinion, or are you aware of this? How much correcting is being done? And so if, if we're blocking people up uh, at an exponential rate, therefore we must be a lot safer here, right? We're, if we're supposed to be correcting people and we've got more people in prison, therefore the question is, does it work? Does it work? Yeah, I think that so what happens after someone is released from jail or prison um, custody? They have lost uh, housing. They have lost maybe any, if any, family support that they had. They have lost, they can't get their driver's license, which has changed a little. What even something as simple as that? When you don't have your driver's license, how do you collect benefits? When you don't have that, how are you making ends meet? How are you then providing for your children? How are you providing for child support payments? It is a a domino effect that. Uh, when someone goes into prison, it's not just affecting that person, which is uh, in of itself like horrific, but now it has seeped into their family, and now it has seeped into generation after generation. What happens to the remainder of the family because of this one, you know, one decision that was made? Yeah, I, I would say we're not going to break this back for it, and and we see it. When I first started law enforcement 25 years ago, I remember thinking the Department of Corrections would release this book of new releases and where they were been released to. And we knew that, okay, that address somebody released, we would start controlling that area because whatever their initial crime was, it won't be long before they start doing it again. And we, we just do it. it, it and, uh, you can almost predict it. And it's because they didn't correct, they didn't help, you know, they didn't. 
the other thing I would say to that too is it's it's really it's not ironic, it's not an issue that we can predict where crime is going to be. In every city in America, you just go find the cities that are under resourced and you find uh, a higher levels of crime. And so it would seem to me that it would, one of the correct parts that we could do would not necessarily just happen at the prisons, but it would also happen in other resource communities, which they have to come back to. Like 95% of people in prison are coming back to our communities. And so if we really want some correction, like we would it seems like we would put some resources in where crime is happening the most of that. But I have to be very smart to say, man, they don't have a lot of jobs and opportunity there. That's where the crime is. Let's put jobs and opportunity there and see what happens. And, and other social services. So yeah, that's my thought. Thank you. Uh, the uh, I, I asked that question because I have an opinion about it. Uh, the uh, I've been around I've been in the criminal justice system for over 20 years, and uh, what my experience is it works a little bit, not really as well as it should by a lot of margins, especially what we expend on it. Um, and uh, if you're a if you're a teenager out there and your parents always say, hey, be careful who you spend time with, you'll become like the people you spend time with. What my experience has been what the data shows that whenever you've been incarcerated, you tend to come out a little bit worse than you went in. It tends to be a graduate school for criminality because you you just spent three, four, five years hanging out with the people a little bit more anti-social. You become like the people that you spend time with. And so when you come back to our community, by the way, 92% of people that come to prison come back to live with us in our community. And I think uh, when it's quite correct, most of us come back into communities that are underserved. And maybe that's a great way to uh, what about how has the high incarceration rate affected our marginalized communities? The communities of color, uh, other historically disadvantaged groups, uh, poverty areas. Um, I think it looks, uh, I think it looks very different, right? Or, or maybe what I should be saying is that it's very multi-faceted, right? Um, uh, like we touched on a little bit earlier, right? When we incarcerate somebody, we don't just incarcerate them, we incarcerate the entire families, entire communities. Um, it's not cheap to go to prison. Um, I think about what it looked like my mom working two or three jobs to make sure we had enough money to not only put food on the table, right, but also to figure out, right, do we have enough money to go visit my dad and my granddad in prison? Um, and now, right, those folks are like, well, do we have enough money to video chat for, what, five, ten minutes with our loved one? And that costs like seven dollars. Um, uh, and then all the phone calls, the letters, postage for those types of things, right, putting money on their books whatever that looks like, right? Because living conditions also take hold um, uh, inside of a, a prison or a jail, right? Living conditions play a very, very big role. Um, I remember, what was it, back? Oh gosh, it feels like time is so small, but also so that's maybe two years ago, right? It feels like one day I ended up, I'm taking out so much, but one day I took a nap and I woke up and there was writing at the Oklahoma County Jail. And I think one of the most important things to realize is that it wasn't folks who were being incarcerated that are being held there saying, let us out now and saying, we need better living conditions. We are living in sewage, right? Um, it takes years off of your life when you go into a prison system. And in Oklahoma, right, if you are going for a property offense or a drug offense, you stay roughly 70% longer than any else in the nation, right? Our partial system, how it's working right now, is a system that is put there to disappear people. It doesn't actually provide the true resources because people have to wait an exponential amount of time to actually get into the corrective courses, right? Or they have too much time so they don't qualify for certain courses. Um, uh, there's a lot, right? Um, for folks who are justice involved directly or indirectly. Um, and I don't know if that truly answers your question, right? Um, uh, but I guess it's just kind of like the tip of the iceberg. 
Judge, I would, I would also add to that, you know, when you talk about the impact on under-resourced communities, we're talking about people of color, uh, black, Hispanic, native, we're talking about, you know, those people in our community. And when we look at uh, the rate of incarceration on those communities, it doesn't, it's not, it doesn't even compare uh, per capita. It doesn't even compare. So uh, if you are African American, uh, you are uh, three times, sometimes five times more likely to be incarcerated than a white male of the same age. And so when you, when you look at that, in those men, just look at the men, and we block up four women, right? But you take the men from the community who uh, would work the jobs, who are leading uh, fathers, protected fathers, away from the home. And that's a massive impact. I don't care if you did that in, in any community, if you took up just a bunch of men, or one group, away from the community, the impact it would have on that community. And so we've done that for a long, sustained amount of time in this country, and then particularly in Oklahoma. And then talk about women. When we take women and do that, uh, we're talking about mothers. We're talking about a shrine and now uh, fathers who may also be just as involved, older grandparents trying to raise uh, kids, and then a foster care system that's going to be heavily impacted by the, the parental being involved in the justice system. And so it is extremely hidden because it's not balanced in the way that we arrest people and incarcerate people. I agree with you. The data is really clear on this. It's not balanced. So, so what are, uh, do we have any answers? Is there reason to be hopeful here? What, what are there, uh, is there any innovation going on in this area that we can point to? Uh, and say this, this is a this is maybe a better way to do it. And maybe I'll maybe start with you, Dave. What do you think about the sort of innovation in uh, dealing with the criminal justice population? Yeah, I, I, um, so I'll just talk about the diversity of what we're doing. So, um, you know, we exist to, to help folks that are uh, getting out of jail. Um, they're still going through the system, right? So, um, Judge can tell you about Oklahoma County uh, criminal justice system. It's a complicated system. It's difficult to, to navigate. And so <clears throat> folks that get out of jail, they have lots of uh, subsequent interactions with folks, right? And to, uh, to get through all of those in a sequential manner, to show up for every court date, to understand how to get a public defender, to um, to do all these things to be successful has been a challenge, and that has really tricked a lot of people up. So we developed a diversion plan to to help folks navigate that justice system, right? So people, um, we get a call almost every day from the jail. Hey, we got six, seven people getting out at ten o'clock this morning. Can you come get it? We send our bus owner or staff member, um, we'll pick them up at the jail, bring them over to the diversion hub. Um, offer them a cup of coffee and then talk about their issues. Um, we focus first on their justice issues because we want to keep them in compliance with whatever the court is ordering. But then we also know there's a lot of other kind of issues housing, mental health, substance abuse, um, all these things that if they're not solved and they're not, those barriers are not overcome, it can lead right back to the, to the justice system. And so we feel like. Um, just a little bit of social services help, standing right alongside all the judges, um, keeping them in, in compliance, is a better alternative um, for the folks that are going through the system. Yeah, the version of this is we're going to hear a lot more about that it was uh, our MAPS floor project, uh, or MAPS, we allocated uh, $17 million actually to build a building. So, any, uh, are you aware of the timeline on that? Uh, what, what are we looking at in the future? Uh, related to the burden. Yeah, uh, we were uh, we were given 17, well, not given, uh, the, the, the city allocated 17 million dollars to build a building for us. Um, we're, if, if we stay on schedule, we will get the keys to the building in quarter two of 2025. So, um, we opened our doors June 8th of 2020 and have been serving out of a, a rental space. Um, we served 
over 2,000 clients last year. Um, what, eight, 9,000 people cycle through the jail every year, and we serve about 2,000 of those folks that came here. And this, this uh, the version of like, yeah, it seems relatively simple, trying to help people with their needs, but it is good. Are you aware of any other communities that are a uh, similar initiative? When uh, we were developing this thing, we had an advisory committee and uh, we had some strategic planning partners that are uh, kind of a nationwide group. And we, one of the missions we gave it was go out and find a, something that would just like what we want to do so we can steal all the policies and procedures and just copy their, their work and they couldn't find it. So we're uh, kind of building it uh, as we go, but um, it's pretty, been pretty effective. So. It's real, real innovation happening, real trailblazing happening right here in Oklahoma City. Uh, decades to come, but look back at what Oklahoma City has done. Uh, the, the, the groundwork is being laid right now. It's, 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 start, it, it's already even it's started what, a year ago? About a year ago? About 18 months. Yeah, 18 months, and it's already having a significant impact. I can't wait to get a 17 minute on building. Uh, you, you, you do some very innovative work. Sure. Uh, so our organization, the nonprofit I work at, so um, most people know what a criminal defense attorney is. That's primarily where I um, practice in, but we represent just mothers um, currently that are um, just as involved. Um, as uh, Judge Stewart said, Oklahoma has an incarceration problem, but uh, also an incarceration problem specific, specifically to women. Um, one of the things that has been a shift in the way that our office functions and other offices have been able to is there is the client is the center of our representation. So oftentimes people say the term client-centered representation. And there's an understanding that a person isn't just one thing, right? A person is multi-layer, they're complex individuals. And these systems that impact our clients are also working together to oftentimes harm our clients. So it's not sometimes just the criminal legal system that they're dealing with. It's not just the possession of a controlled substance. That possession of a controlled substance um, has now impacted their um, ability, or someone has decided that because they had this amount of drugs, this is going to impact their right to parent their child. So the uh, foster care system gets involved. And so in our office, there is a group of attorneys who work in criminal law, there is a group of attorneys who work in uh, family law, specifically in the foster care system. And then there's a group of attorneys that work in housing, um, evictions. All of these are interrelated, right? All these systems, they don't exist on their own. They are all take each other um, and intersect with one another. And so the innovation that our office is able to bring to our clients is it is a one-stop shop. Um, because also you can't take off of work to meet with five different lawyers. That is a lot. You're missing employment, you're missing payment. Like, you're not getting money. You're going to think all of these things that all kind of get all at once. So they come into our office, they're able to meet with multiple lawyers, and then they also are able to meet with non attorney staff who work towards um, what is the actual, like, what is the issue that's like impacting you in a day to day way? Is it that your electricity is about to be shut off because you haven't been able to make the payment? And if your electricity is shut off, then is DHS going to get involved and say that you're? you know, essentially too poor to parent, right? And so we have ways that uh, non-attorney staff that find out if there's any um, social service organization that's willing to pay um, to keep like, our clients' lives on for, you know, there's a lot of um, community, I'm sure in Oklahoma City too, my background is in Tulsa, there are social service organizations that are willing to do that and that's been the benefit, but I think the innovation that we're able to offer clients um, or folks that are involved is that we can see them as an entire complex individual and can recognize that there's multiple systems impacting them. So we can actually, you know, take if there is if it is possible to completely remove them from system involvement versus just putting like a band-aid um, kind of board. I know you do some innovative work and mentoring leadership you yeah, so I want to talk about two things. I'm trying to scoop them both in and a little time, but 
you know, we, we already talked about what we've done, the criminal justice system that's done by taking folks out of communities, uh, just for public safety purposes, uh, and for accountability purposes, whatever the reason may be, but we've done it at an alarming rate. And so what we know that uh, in those other under-resourced places in our city is that they need positive caring adults to help them make good decisions, to help them process issues that they through their life because of the lack of a positive care and uh, so what we've done at the Oklahoma City Police Department is we created a mentor program called FAT, which is a youth outreach program. And this is just full-time police officers going in and offering mentorship uh, to these underserved communities and taking volunteers from around the city and matching them in front of these, these young people. We do a, a ton of fascinating things with them. So uh, uh, but we, what we found out is two things. We humanize the badge and find out that there's really a person behind them. Bulletproof vests, and because we wear plain clothes and we drive plain cars, uh, and we introduce them to uh, our just our daily lives. We humanize the action that way, but we also learn a lot about about them and where they come from and what they're dealing with. Because you know, on patrol, we have to go put up the crime scene, investigate the crime, take away the perpetrator, stop the blood and the madness, and move on to the next call. Well, here we're in a relationship, authentic relationship, and so it's never ending. We have uh, our phone is ringing. Today, helping young people navigate life just as teenagers, and then tra trauma that they might get in their life because of what they did and the choices they made with caring people in their life. Made. So, that, that, I don't know if that's innovative, that it's not innovative, it's just one thing that's innovative about it is that the law enforcement the police department said we have got to do something to get to offer a resource uh, in these communities to help uh, combat poor decision making that feeds the system. The other thing I'd like to highlight, too, is something that David, David and I are involved in is the Oklahoma Justice Circle. And the Oklahoma Justice Circle is just a group of community leaders and faith leaders that come together and say, you know, we need to, we need to uh, do something about the narrative in our, in, our, in our city, and that starts with a relationship. So we, we actually hold events that call people from different sides of the town, different set of circumstances and perspective, and we have a dinner and a breakfast. And we throw in uh, conversations and questions that they have to talk about over, over a meal and get to know each other. And questions might be, when was the first time you realized race mattered in your life? You know, that kind of thing. When did, when did, uh, when, how did the George Floyd incident uh, make you feel? And how did it impact you? How do you feel about police? You know, and, and have everybody share their different perspective on that. Is there such thing as racism? In your world and have people talk about that. Because it is really intimidating if you don't have a facilitated conversation uh, to have the courage to dive into that. What we find by that is now people are leaning into the same these very questions that we have. What does justice look like and what does mercy look like? And how and who is my neighbor? Right? And so it's just an innovative approach to call the city to one place and break bread together and be involved in that relationship and ask them to step into those uncomfortable conversations. Authentic relationships. Who's my neighbor? That's what it's all about. I represent you on the legislative side or otherwise related to where the innovation or uh, progress of the justice. I think, um, yet again, I'm very kind of multi task, but I think a lot of things play into the reimagining and rebuilding of our justice system in Oklahoma and communities of mine. Um, I think about when we passed bills that allowed um, uh, funding for mental health uh, resources in, in public education systems and what that really kind of looks like. If we can set the example in our public education system, then why can't we do that right in, in our municipalities when it comes to law enforcement officers and how um, and, and those mental health requirements to become clean certified and things like that, right? Um, and starting those conversations is to represent. Um, but I also think about how um, as young folks, as, as people in the community, right? Uh, the folks who are thinking about how, or if you were paying attention, right? So Oklahoma City, I think specifically, got maybe $1.3 million to devote to correcting right, our issues with our law enforcement, right? Um, uh, and, and figuring out what communities, right, what the Oklahoma City community is saying we need to prioritize with that. So I think from that 1.3 million, there's initially around like 300,000, right? That we're trying to decide what initiatives Oklahomans care most about, right? 
why and where to put that, where to put those resources. So, what uh, I do, um, what I've been able to do with uh, community organizers, other, uh, I guess, city councilors in the, in the district and things like that are, last summer we had a conversation, right, um, specifically over reimagining justice and what it really looks like for us. Um, we compiled the notes from everybody who came up to share where we should put this money, um, uh, and then we sent those over to city council. And then we did the same thing again, right, um, and make sure that we were uh, upping that, that that's what we can. I think just last week, when city council was willing to actively uh, vote on where that money goes, right? Um, so making sure that we are connecting people to policy in the way that they haven't been before. That's the only way I got elected, right? So we were able to reach people in politics, through politics, in a way that they hadn't been connected before. Because of the state of the world and Oklahoma, right, specifically, it's very easy to be disillusioned, right? Or to say, like, this is very hard to work, I don't know if I'm going to really check into it. <laughs> but when we don't show up to those conversations, right, when we don't bring our thoughts and our opinions, right, that diversity in, that, in, in how we interact with the system, then the system gets to continue to work against us, right? Um, and so we make sure that we're continuously having those conversations, right, um, and making sure that we restore, right, people's faith in, in their voices and in their power, which is how we get a lot of the back of the stopped um, uh, in the legislature, too, right? Um, so continuously having those conversations. But I think it's also, right, not just the specific resources that we're providing, and that it's very, very important to make sure that we're moving in a direction that has all of us in mind, right? But it's also how we think about the steps that we take to get there, right? It's not just the win and the aim, but the means to get there. Because there are some times when we will, when I think specifically when it comes to policy and or some kind issues that we put forth, we'll say, okay, this is a really good incremental step, but we don't think about how this step impacts everybody differently. I am adamantly opposed to hate crime laws, and that's because they disproportionately affect my LGBTQ plus community, and within that, right, my LGBTQ plus community of color, right? Um, one in five trans women have, has said that they have been incarcerated at one point in time in their life work. Right? We think about how we, when we lock up others, right? We take away the hope out of a community. And I think that's really important to realize too, that our laws in Oklahoma, we, like we mentioned earlier, we don't have people who are worse here than any place else, but we have laws that are archaic, that are bigoted, right? When we say, when we continuously lock people up for failure to protect charges, right? We look at the 20 halls of Oklahoma, of the nation, right? This was a woman who was serving a 30 year sentence, two 15 year back to back sentences for being in the home and being abused while her children were there too. And her abuser, I think, got maybe two years. We have to think critically about how every step we take could really uplift an entire community if we were being very intentional. But if we aren't being intentional, it could do a lot of damage to people who aren't on that service level. And I think that's one of the most important things, right? So sometimes I get a little flat for when I vote um, uh, against a bill that people think might be criminal justice reform or criminal justice reimagining behind it, but I have to say, like, there are so many other communities that are deeply affected by this that we need to think about, right? And we have to continuously have those conversations because criminal justice reimagining and rebuilding is more than just the surface level steps that we take, but it's about equitability. It's about community liberation, right? And from a deep level, when we understand that when we take the time to step back and uplift everybody, that everybody gets to move forward, right? Everybody gets to cross the finish line of liberation with us. So, very thankful for every service that everybody is providing, but also the intentionality behind the service that everybody is providing is very, very important too. So. Thank you. Uh, so, curious about So uh, we're, we're going to pause right here. Uh, let you guys kind of ponder on that a minute and just have a chance. How long are we going to break for you, James? Five minutes, ten minutes. We're going to take a, we're going to take a short break. Everybody kind of walk around, stretch their legs, don't go too far. Uh, and then I guess whenever uh, Shannon rings the bell, kind of every seat back in here. How long are you going to break? Five to ten minutes. Five to ten minutes? Yeah. Come back in here. What we're going to do is we'll have to have some more questions.
the panel. And also, if you have a question that you'd like to ask the panel, we'd really like to hear from you. Any, any thoughts or questions that you have. So, see you back here shortly. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.
to read that. Uh, so, and thank you. If you have some uh, questions that have been submitted, so I appreciate that. And we'll ask our panel to chime in. And there's uh, a couple minutes to sign our, our, our panelists. So, uh, matter of fact, one of the kind of dovetails on what we've been talking about up here uh, is we like the authentic conversation in relation to we're still, this is still a work in progress, and we're still trying to figure it out. And we're in a very interesting time in our history where, uh, you know, with George Floyd really bringing to the forefront that our law enforcement has to approach, has, has to change. It could be I got a lot of change uh, in our law enforcement and how our police officers work on the street. That is a reality. The other reality that we have to stay safe, and police are the guardian and help us remain in the keep us safe community. Um, and even though I can recognize there's a lot of problems within the police department, uh, police, police officers that I know, the sheriff deputies I know, they're very professional, they are very well intentioned, and they want to do the right thing. And there's this, there's this disconnect because they've got to change, we have to change, they seem to be well intentioned. Then we have, then we have this, uh, you know, uh, a, a cry for me, we've got to defund the police, and where does that go? Uh, an interesting, I read a statistic about what it takes to become a police officer. You gotta have, in the neighborhood, about 600 hours of training. You have your police certification and your field training, about 600 hours. To become a hairdresser, you have to have 2,000 hours. And so the amount of training it takes to become a police officer is you know, a fraction of what it takes to become a hairdresser. And so uh, there's, there's a lot of tension between these different any idea of where we go from here. Um, and so I would like, if, if, if our panel has any, any comment about uh, you know, what is it that our police we've got to do different, and what do you think about this idea of defunding the police? What does that even mean? Well, the police officer. The police officer is going to say, <laughs> uh, Yeah, but you know, there's, when you, when you sit down and talk about the fun of police, you really have to dissect it, what, what is the person, what's the definition of the fun of police? Because I've sit down with person A, and they're like, I just want to the police, they're just they're bad, I want to tear it all down, I want to do it over and over again. Stop, take the money that you give the police, and give it to the social services, and okay, well, that's, to me, that's crazy. But then you talk to other people and say, you know what, I just want to, uh, instead of buying tanks next year, I want to use the money that you uh, use to militarize the police department and put it into social services. But there needs to be a balanced approach between how much you spend on police and how much you spend on social services. Now I'm ready to have that conversation. Uh, because the, the, we know the all the common denominator of crime. We know that. And if we start investing in the things to prevent crime in the first place, that makes the community safer. That is not the police's job. The job of the police is to respond to crime, investigate crime, arrest and detain uh, the criminals. The community's job is to make the community safe by investing in people, investing in the other, caring about the other, making sure that we know, that we know our neighbors, right? And so if we do that, uh, with a balanced approach, but I think we're going to be really, really happy with the public safety that we get from police officers. What happens, and she said it before, what happens is we default, we don't know what to do with it, we don't know where else to go. So, call the police. You will be surprised that I have been uh, in homes for animals. Uh, a lady had a, a, a snake, a snake, a little bitty snake that was caught with some duct tape in her outlet. I don't know what to do. All of these. <laughs> you know? uh, I mean, this might be the one of the most crazy stuff that we can cover. And, and every officer I know is really happy to serve in those capacities. But uh, there's a lot of things we go to uh, and get training for and all this kind of stuff that would be well served if someone else was called first. And if it got out of hand and looked at him with it, we would love to be the person or the entity to come and, and, and serve and to help those other so that I'm talking about social services, I'm talking about nonprofits, and I'm talking about the community of benefit. Sure. Uh, I, I, 
this, this is just Dan's opinion, right? But um, unless there is an alternative to what is happening, you just keep the status quo, right? And so this is what we've been doing. This is how we know how to do what we're doing. So I think it's incumbent upon us to come up with ideas uh, that are alternatives, right? So when we just talked about, uh, you know, please get the call for everything. Um, North Care, one of our um, largest mental health providers, nonprofit mental health providers in town, um, just was awarded a grant to do a pilot project in Oklahoma City to go out with the police on mental health calls. Um, what happens typically, when they can probably attest to this, is uh, somebody is causing a nuisance, um, you know, having a mental health episode, causing a nuisance, uh, that store owner or that property owner doesn't want them there, they call the police. The police show up, try to escort the person off, the person resists, and they get arrested, right? Spit on the police officer, something like that. We see all the time placing bodily fluid on a police officer is a charge of people for the jail. Um, so, North Care said, well, uh, we saw this, pro this program in Colorado, it seemed to work. Let's try it here in Oklahoma City. Um, so, in, in my opinion, um, you know, if somebody walks in, to anyone's house with a gun, you're gonna you're gonna pray that the neighbor sees that and calls the police. So, you know, eliminating the police on the option. I think it's finally proving that there's better alternatives to all of the police interactions that we have today, and then showing the community that they work. So um, once you know we've, we've been in existence for 18 months, we've been collecting data on recidivism. So um, you know, typically recidivism, I think most of us think about, I went to prison, got out of prison, went back to prison. That's recidivism, right? Uh, we work in a pretrial space, so people are arrested for something and get out of jail, still innocent until they're revealed to Christ, they're going through the process. So we raised the bar for that and said, we don't want you to have any more interactions with the, with the jail, period. So we're tracking our folks. Once they come to us, do you go back to jail while you're in our services? Do you go back to jail a year after we close the case and we set you on that upward trajectory? Um, see if uh, our programs are making a difference in the community. And then when we can prove to the citizens that this is a better alternative to incarceration, I think then we'll see the money coming. Maybe we need less police presence. Maybe we need more social service presence. Um, but I think it's incumbent upon us as social service providers, as innovative thinkers, to prove that there is an alternative to incarceration. Thank you. Uh, it's a, if there's not a group of smart people that are coming to the East and West Coast to come in and fix this for us, we've got to do this ourselves. Uh, any, uh, comment on that? We do have some, uh, if there's a the comment or the, the student questions. Uh, let's, if you don't mind, let's go. We have some really excellent questions from our students. And so, uh, Representative Turner, do you want to start? If you've got a question there, would you want to read the question and uh, share your thoughts on it? Yeah. Um, this first question I have says How has the state legislature system impacted the criminal, impacted the criminal justice system, uh, both good and bad? And um, I guess that, that, that's really it in a nutshell, right? Is that we do some really good things. Because of the strides that communities make, because of state question 780, right, um, uh, which uh, took um, federal or I'm not going to go on, but it took uh, property and crime offenses. So 780 is another number one one legalized American federal marijuana in Oklahoma. If I remember that correctly, um, but some of the things, right, that the legislature, because right, Oklahomans, we are in a place where we are self medicating because we do not have access to healthcare, right? And in COVID times, right, our hospital areas in Oklahoma City and Tulsa are running low because folks from rural Oklahoma are coming here because the healthcare system is vanishing in rural Oklahoma, right? Um, uh, and that seems like in itself enough to make sure that we are trying to create a good system for medical cannabis, right, in that type of medical care. What Oklahoma, the legislature has done since then, right, has tried to rip away at, at, at different parts of 780. 
Um, and I think one of the big things, right, is that the people showed up and they said, this is what we want, right? I think to kind of go back to something that was mentioned a little, bit, a little earlier is that communities have been asking for what we need, right? Community organizing works because communities fill the gaps that are policy holders, right? Um, policy makers that they leave for us when they don't intentionally create policy with our communities in mind. And if we're listening, Right. If we are the type of stakeholders, if we are the type of community advocates that can say we are, then we're listening to the folks, right? Because the folks closest to the problems are closest to the solutions because they've been created. Um, I think about how this year, right, I sat in a committee and uh, this week I voted on a, a, a there was a bill presented that I think 3351, House Bill 3351, if you want to look at it. But it's a bill that allows parents to pay teachers up to a thousand dollars out of their pocket into a teacher's pocket, and a teacher can use it for whatever they want to. For some people, right, when they look at it, that's a really great solution to our underfunded public education system. But yet again, it's one of those things where we're not thinking critically about how it's going to undermine the effect of our our cities, right, our municipalities, our public school systems, that we don't realize the harm. Right. The majority of those funds are probably going to come from our Edmund, OKC, Tulsa areas, right? And in the bill it says if you're not a parent, if you're not a guardian, you can't give, right? If I'm a grandparent, I can't give. I can't give up $2,000 to a teacher. And then on top of that, the parents who are able to fund Oklahoma's public education system like that, right? Because we're switching classes all day. So if I can give money to several different teachers, um, there's a good chance I'm probably not sending my kid to public education in Oklahoma, right? Um, and so I think about that and, that, and the cap on that is to, is that once we reach $5 million, parents can't give it to them, Oklahoma teachers anymore, right, as a whole. But I also think inadvertently, right, how last year in our fiscal, um, uh, I said on uh, appropriations and budget, which just means like this is, we're listening to people, they ask us for money, we say, okay, we'll give you this much. And I sit on appropriations and budget for judiciary needs in Oklahoma, right? So the district attorney's councils, attorney generals. And I'm thinking about how last year we gave an entity $2 million dollars and we're saying we're gonna stop Oklahomans, right? Everyday Oklahomans at five million to give you public education. When I asked why we weren't going to fund public education adequately from the legislature, why we wouldn't ask parents to put that burden, right, to carry that burden, the presenter of the bill said, we don't have the appetite to fund Oklahoma education, but maybe parents will. And I think that's one of, there's three kind of fundamental things, right, but one of the most fundamental things are that our budgets, they take what we care about. They are really good, so I want to encourage you, right, it's the nitty gritty of like getting involved, but Take a look at the budget of the entity that you are trying to move. Where are they getting money from? Where are they giving money to? Right? I think that's fundamentally important because if we're saying $5 million is what could help public education in Oklahoma, and they're willing to give the Attorney General $10 million and we won't do the same for public education, I think that's really important, right? Is that we've done a really bang up job of keeping families and individuals incarcerated more than being left in physical prison. Sometimes long before they even touch it. Our budgets really dictate the things that we're interested in and the things that we are going to devote our time to. The conversation about defunding the police, I think it really shifts for a lot of people when we realize that we've been defunding resources in our communities in order to fund the police for so long. What happens, right? I was able to go into a young but what I think about Just Mercy, right, and specifically the All Gosh Children chapter, where we talk about life without parole for juveniles, right? Um, we talk about Eden, right, and Cuneo. I think about the first time one of my classmates was tried as an adult. We just we had just left fifth grade, we were heading into sixth grade. We were heading into middle school. Right? And I think about what we talk about. Some of our friends are in our city in the system right, are well intentioned and well mannered, right? I'm telling you right now, we 
we take and contain our interactions with people. Somebody can show who, who is actively racist towards me as a black woman, be actively racist towards somebody who's white, because why would they need to be? Why would they need to weaponize that or show that power or authority or fear to somebody? We have to critically think about the conversations that we have, and words mean things. They are very, very powerful. Um, and so that's, I guess, a little bit of everything, right? But the state has done some really, really great things, right? Like making sure you're having funding for public education, um, specifically when it comes to mental health resources. Um, and But we can also do a pretty big job of nipping and tucking away at things that make it harder for open women to survive, right? And that's what fuels our justice system, not only creating new crimes and fines that create a debtor's prison, right? But also not resources for Oklahomans to survive, let alone thrive, right? That looks like creating living wages, right? It might also really look like universal child care, right? Kindergarten. Parents need to be able to provide for their families, right? They need to be able to have the resources in order to do that. And so, yes, it's our justice system, right? And it's something that it touches to. That was one of the questions. I don't know if I should. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, David, do you have a question? Yeah. Uh, so, my question. Students or adults are interested in being involved with organizations that focus on justice reform slash advocacy. What advice would you give them? So I think it depends on the level of involvement you want you want to pursue. Obviously, there's great career paths in uh, criminal justice and, and, and advocacy. So uh, happy to speak with you offline about career paths. But what can you do today? Um, you know, stay informed. What you're doing tonight is, is amazing. Um, I didn't have this opportunity in high school, uh, so uh, kudos to, to school and, and you guys for showing up. Um, uh, one of your teachers was asking about volunteer opportunities, specifically at the first moment. Unfortunately, uh, we have to be 18 volunteer for us because of safety concerns, but we've had schools um, do drives for us. Um, you know, I don't know if you know this, but whatever you get arrested wearing is what you get discharged from jail wearing. And so in Oklahoma, sometimes seasons change in a matter of hours, days. Um, and so we have uh, lots of need for, for things for people when they, when they come in. Um, the, the hottest ticket item in the entire diversion hub is sneakers. Um, lots of folks coming without shoes on. So, uh, we, we would welcome any kind of uh, drive um, that you want to participate in. Um, if you want to come over to the first WC and um, ask more questions, we'll be happy to, to talk to you about that. I think, though, just curiosity and education and um, just get involved for everything. Uh, actually, you have a so uh, I think it's just something that I feel the younger generation is really good at, uh, just Googling things. And so um, for, for, for my organization, um, we, we have had high school interns, uh, especially in the summer, which is like prime intern time um, in our office from law students to undergrad, uh, undergraduate interns to high school interns. And one of the things that I would suggest is if this is something that is passionate um, for you, it's just one area, you don't even have to actually know what area specifically you really want to get into. It is just a Google search term of criminal justice organizations, Oklahoma City, Tulsa, wherever, and just see what's there. I receive emails from students around the country, students from Tulsa that just want to come and like observe, and that is something that I am more, our organization is more than happy to do. Um, I know kind of public defender organizations, prosecutor work, there may be some qualifications at each organization, or just like whether it's um, kind of safety concerns or just protocols, um, confidentiality reasons, but just, you know, I, I wish there was a better answer than just Google it. Um, I still do that as an attorney. But that is the best way to do it. The other thing, I uh, wanted to echo something Representative Turner stated. One of the first things I did when I moved to Tulsa was just start sitting in on city council meetings. I really wanted to understand what, where 
where money was going in my community, what my community, my, the people I elected to be uh, a voice for me, what they were saying. And so in the last two years, one benefit that has happened is there is a lot of things that are online and a lot of things are live stream. So sit in on it and then if there's someone that's interesting to you on panels or your city councilor or whoever it is, contact them and ask if you can shadow them for a day. I think most uh, folks would be open to that suggestion, so uh, I think that would be my suggestion if you're interested in this. Thank you. Uh, what do you have a student question too? I do. It says, uh, what can we do to help bridge the gap between community members and the police when we continue to see the rise of incarceration and the highest levels of police involvement and slash homicides? Couple of, couple of things there, and I mean, I'm, I'm with this with uh, representative here is it's multifaceted. But I will, the thing that I wrote down here to remind myself to tell you is as a community, we need to celebrate what we want to see more of. Uh, we don't see, we, there's a lot of good things that I know our police department is doing. There's a lot of good programs in our community that, that is doing. And, and it seems like we have to, you know, Bring bells and bike the media to do, you know, just to get a, a little bit of attention about the good things that we've done. Because, it's, because the media is dominated by the things we don't really want to see. Uh, so when you see officers doing, uh, going far beyond their duty, and it is happening all the time, uh, I think that should be celebrated. There's also an opportunity, at least here in Oklahoma City, there's an opportunity to get to know officers on a personal level and engage them in conversation to invite them to things like, like this, uh, to your neighborhood, to the school, uh, all kinds of things. But here's the challenge. When you are involved, and I, and I challenge my officers the same way too, so when you come to the unit and work with me, allow yourself to change by any conversation. Don't be stuck on your perspective. Because there are so many other types of people, so many other types of perspectives, so there's and people respond differently to different circumstances. One thing that makes you scream may make you laugh, right? So uh, allow yourself to be changed by the conversation. Allow room for another perspective. Uh, consider what that might be like. And, and so I think what happens is we enter conversations dug in on our belief and our way is the right way and the only way. But what happens when we get into our mental relationship and we start caring about our neighbor and the other is it changes us and we want to see everybody do well. And so uh, I think we, as police officers, uh, have, uh, over, over time, I've gotten way, way better at this uh, because our training, because of the times. I can tell you that when I was uh, 20 years ago as an officer, there was a lot of conversations on the training because I didn't have to, right? I'm the authority figure, you do like I say. Uh, and when I say do it, and, and law enforcement is not that way, and so it's a lot more open, uh, it's a lot more opportunity, but, but the tradition of law enforcement still presents itself in our uniform. So when you walk up to them, everybody assumes that I'm trying to get you in trouble or looking for the man and all that kind of stuff. So uh, one thing I'm saying is just make room for relationship with an officer. When it comes to uh, impartial, impartialization, also involved shootings, you know, the loss of our shoes is very complicated. Very complicated. They have to very, very fast. Uh, and, and most of the times when you see uh, a lot of loss of our shoes, we have to, for me, this is just for me, I, I'm really thinking about the, the amount of guns in, in a particular community. And we ask the officers to, uh, I mean, guns are legal here. Everybody can have them. And the officer is now on the heels that every single person, somebody's in there is armed besides me, I'm sure. <laughs> I have to assume that for everybody's safety. And so uh, it, it makes way all this country for mistakes to happen. And uh, so it's complicated. And, and I'm just, I'm just thinking that those impartial, those shooting rates across our country is going to be in communities where uh, gun ownership is really, really high. And, and it puts the officer in a, in a state mindset when he deals with the public and, and thinks that he don't know and he has to figure out and investigate. And so it's very, very dangerous. Uh, but 
does not distinguish from the officer. It's dangerous to you, the, the, the name. And so uh, it, it's complicated, but I think if you have conversation, authentic relationship, and make it way more on the other, then we can reduce and make this a lot safer. Thank you, Ryan. That's a, these are some of the people who have been 
been doing this for decades, and that is honestly like just the thing that kind of keeps me going, and even coming to these talks, coming to specifically speaking with students, um, is very energizing for me to know that there's just there's there's these conversations that are happening that weren't happening um, while they were the actions were happening, the conversations weren't happening, and so that's very hopeful. Um, and the way to get involved, I think we kind of talked about it earlier, is just find what interests you and just lead into it, whether in the criminal legal system, criminal justice, environmental justice, social justice generally, just find your path and you know, find folks who've been doing this and just learn from them and then also push them, push them to be better and harder um, and imagine, reimagine it. Man, are you kidding? I am, I'm with the young people every day, so I am super hopeful. Uh, a lot of reasons to have fun. But let me give you a, a couple of reasons where I don't you know. The, uh, this this week, uh, Monday, uh, I'm talking with one of our students in our program, in our outreach program, and mentor who's been around for a long time, several years. And I'm looking at his shoes. His shoes are a big deal. And his shoes are bad. <laughs> and so I made up my mind. I said, hey, I'm going to figure out a way to get him to get him some shoes. So I said, hey, bro, what do you need? Now, I just want to know what you need, not what you want, what you need. Tell me what you need. Uh, and he's looking down at the shoes, I'm looking down at the shoes, and I know it's coming, and I'm just going to go and tell the officers, hey, I need some shoes. Go, go, go find out some shoes. He looks down at his shoes, he looks up, pulls his mask down, and says, I need a dentist, I've got a tooth in two minutes. Kill him. He absolutely floor him. Uh, so I'm going to prepare for I walk back to the office where my team is, the team of officers are, and I tell them about this interaction, and to watch them mobilize, to find a resource, to get that kid attention for dental care, was, it, it gave me hope. On the other side, on the other side of that, you know, last week we had an officer shot. And it went all over the news. And every last one of the officers in the program got text messages from various kids in the program saying, are you okay? How are you doing? That gives me hope because we can fight together. We've done, uh, we have authentic relationships and we care about each other and we know what we're involved in. <clears throat> we know what these other is doing. And what gives us hope is that our young people now have a, a, a healthy respect for what officers do and who they are. But the officers who are going to be promoting soon, promoting up the ranks, know who our community is and what they're up against. And I've got to think that's going to change for the better for all. Yeah, um, uh, I think to echo something shared earlier, right? I think to be in this type of work is to be hopeful, right? We are actively striving to build a better Oklahoma, to create a type of team state that folks that we're trying to be, right? Um, I think specifically when I think about students or folks that are really kind of keeping in. I often right, think back to my time in classrooms here at Harding. Right? My journey with you all started long before I was an elected official. I remember when I first came and gave my first presentation in the class. And the questions right, that students were asking back many years ago were how do you de escalate situations? Quite honestly, right? That was the, the number one thing I was asked, right? What is, can I do? I know your rights training and how to de escalate situations, right? Whether it's in contact with school resource officers or law enforcement officers outside of this place. And it's so invigorating, but also equally heartbreaking, right? Like, I love the students want to know what do we need to know, right? But also, right, the question is how do we protect ourselves, right? In these real situations, when we see folks who, when we lose community members, right, we lose our friends and our family, what can we do? And I think one of the biggest parts for me, being a community organizer, as, like, aside from a, a representative, is that community continues to show up, like I was saying earlier, right? Magic happens when we show up and we magically take care of each other, right? When we fill the gaps that policy leaves for us, when we engage in that mutual aid, 
but also when we rise to, to, to assume these positions, right? Because I remember being with you, I remember getting involved in high school, right? In middle school, because my mom told me to, I didn't know what else to do. Um, and I remember what it's like to feel like I didn't have a voice. I remember what it's like to think I would make it to this age as an LGBTQ plus youth in Oklahoma. Like, I can tell you that, right? And I know that people receive and process situations differently. And I get to sit here in front of you and talk to you all by the grace of God, because my siblings, my classmates, don't get the same opportunity. And so as long as I'm presented with a chance to not only amplify my community's voice, but to figure out how we creatively take care of one another, I'm gonna do it. And I'm so glad that I get to do it with you all. I'm so glad that you can continue to allow me to come back and talk to you too. Because it's one of the greatest hopes that I get. It's uh, I used to live right across the street here. And to be able to wake up every day and go into work and say, well, there, there are gonna be people here with us, right? Because like I said, magic happens when we show up. Like nothing about us without us, and I mean that, right? To my last breath, I mean it. So very, very helpful. And there's a lot of work left to do. Thank you, Margaret. Uh, we have to take care of each other. Uh, that's uh, I'm sure they want to tell you there. There's we have a lot of energy, and we think all the problems get solved. It's like Bernie Lincoln over at St. Chapel, or problems get solved at City Council. Really, uh, for a panel of to just the two, there's problems to solve where we are. And so, you know, maybe if you're great to start, just take care of your block, where do you live, your neighborhood, get to know your neighbors. How can you help? How can we? Support each other, continue these conversations, continue the dialogue, uh, come back out. So, um, thank you guys for coming. We'll be good on time. We're good for our All right. So, thank you. 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 Thank you.